My plan now is to try and articulate our comprehensive, uh, holistic, ethical decision-making framework. Um, not just so that you're familiar with this and you need to be for accreditation, but indeed for your everyday practice, your everyday clinical practice. Um, there are many stages, there are nine stages actually, uh, which promotes uh, reflective thought. And every uh, regulated staff member which belongs to a college would know that uh, reflective thought is something that is highly recommended for all um, healthcare professionals. Um, the benefits of, regulated, uh, of, of uh, reflective thought sorry, is to evaluate your own intuitions because oftentimes we make decisions by going by our gut feelings. Um, it, it appraises other people's arguments. This is why when you, when you have an interdisciplinary team meeting further to encountering a complex, a complex ethical issue, uh, that you should suspend decision making. You should listen very attentively to other people's justifications for the positions that they hold. You would find it with the four ethical principles uh, that we all agree upon them. But when it comes to resolving an ethical dilemma, it's how do you prioritize those principles? And that's key. And that's what this um, critical uh, ethical decision-making process allows you to do. The first step in the, in the uh, ethical decision-making process is to identify the problem as best as you can. So it starts with that uh feeling in your tummy, but what really is going on? What's causing you to be perplexed? What's causing you to, to have these squams, right? Uh, other questions would be, and who are the stakeholders who are going to be impacted by this um, decision? Who are the resources that need to be part of the conversation, right? Because again, now you have a rather complex, if not complicated, ethical issue. The second step in the process would be um, acknowledge your feelings. We all feel incredibly strongly when we're, when we're contemplating doing the right thing, especially when it involves uh, serious ramifications like end of life or uh, amputations or whatever it might be, artificial nutrition, hydration, in mental health, um, um, seclusion, seclusion of patients, or restraining patients for a prolonged periods of time for their own good because they're banging themselves against the wall and, and hurting themselves. So what are those feelings and why are you feeling those? Uh, um, why do you have those emotions? Um, is it because you're being triggered and we call this uh, transference and counter-transference? Is it because that patient reminds you of your mother or your child? In which case you need to harness those feelings, but continue to be passionate about what's at stake. Because as you know only too well as clinicians, there is a great deal at stake. Some, a whole family and a patient in particular is depending upon you to be very, very critical in your, in your thinking. And to disallow prejudice and biases and discriminatory factors from entering. Um, the conversation. The third step is, of course, gather facts. What do we mean by facts? Well, clinical facts, social facts. Um, uh, when we actively engage with our patients, hopefully soon upon admission, hopefully we would do advanced care planning with the patient and ask the patient about what information do we need to know about them as unique individuals to enable us to provide them with with patient-focused care and treatments, and so on and so forth. So gather clinical facts, social facts, cultural facts, religious facts, uh, spiritual facts, because remember, we claim to take a philosophy of holistic uh, patient care. Um, the next stage uh, that we move to would be uh, consider alternatives. What alternatives exist uh, with regard to caring for this patient. It might be two, three, four different alternatives or options. 
And uh, that's not alien to us as clinicians, because if you think about it, uh, we're trained to use differential diagnosis. So we start, you know, with one and see whether or not we could exclude that based on the fact that, that we're taking a, a heavy-handed approach in dealing with a relatively simple matter to do with patient care. So for example, um, if a patient is verbally abusive in psychiatry or in the eMERGE department, we're not going to start giving that patient antipsychotic medication or start uh, restraining that patient. That would be disproportionate. So starting from the, di from the various options that we would explore, from the least invasive, the least intrusive, the one that, where there is the greatest benefits to the patient and the least harms, that would be ideal uh, um, as, a, as an option. And also consider what harms are we trying to prevent. And the harms could be, of course, it's dignity eroding or it's therapeutic alliance eroding, right? We've got to continue to work with the patient. So building trust with the patient is incredibly important. Um, a quick example here might be a patient who's had a mild stroke. And we, and we believe under the Highway Traffic Act that we have a duty to report the patient to the ministry. Well, before picking up the phone and reporting to the ministry, what we ought to do is to have a conversation with the patient, patient's family members and so on and so forth, and remind the patient that it's not we who pull the patient's license, that's entirely up to the ministry. In that way, we're hopefully safeguarding therapeutic alliance because we want the patient to continue to trust us so that they'd be compliant to our recommendations and so on and so forth. Uh, the next step would be examine values, and as I mentioned before, everything about ethics has to, with, has to do with values, right? That's how it's different from the law. The law is about pieces of legislation, statutory law and case law, but when it comes to values, doing the right thing, was, uh, how fair is this, how just is this, was it, what does this say about me as one human being to another human being? Um, so what values is at play here? And remember, always remember that the primary stakeholder, the person who has most at stake, that is the person who's going to live with the consequences, is our patient. So I have values, all of us around the table have values and, and opinions about and perspectives around certain uh, options, but always try and safeguard the patients. That's the most important, that's the primary stakeholder. Other values, of course, would be organizational values and mission. How well um, does this particular choice cohere with, or indeed, does it violate any of our mission and core values? Uh, we don't want to do that. Um, five, uh, stage six, sorry, is to evaluate the alternatives. So now we, we're looking at, um, there are about 20 ethical uh, principles from which we derive ethical principles and the ethical principles are as anyone who is who belongs to a college would know respect for autonomy which basically means don't touch me until I give you consent so my right to self-governance without interference right the second one is beneficence that we as a community as a hospital we always have a duty to do things uh, to intervene in ways that would have a net benefit to the patient. This is why sometimes, for example, in the ICU, where there is no longer a net benefit to a patient who is crashing, who has multiple organ failure, we, it makes us feel quite uncomfortable. That's when we tend to use terms like, we think it's futile. Uh, the third ethical principle would be non-maleficence, which means to never cause harms. It's based on the 2,500 year old Hippocratic Oath. First or above all, do no harm. So again, uh, every intervention, every medication we use has harms, but we're always going to choose the option where there is proportionate benefits right, uh, to the patient. And the last one, of course, is justice. And there are two sense of justice when it comes to the principle of justice. One is distributive justice, how do we allocate our scarce resources in a fair and just manner, right? Uh, traditionally, we would find that, or his, 
historically that the elderly and people with serious and persistent mental illness or the marginalized would receive the least amount of, of uh, resources from that um, limited pie. And we have to be very mindful that in this day and age, uh, that arguably uh, perhaps those vulnerable people who don't have anyone to advocate for them should actually receive even preferential treatment. That's something for you to think about. It depends on how high you want to elevate that ethics bar. Um, the second sense of justice is that we must never use uh, morally irrelevant factors and considerations uh, to enter any decision-making process. And that's what this ethical decision-making process helps us to do, is to sift out things like biases and prejudices and discrimination. So the fact that the patient might be morbidly obese must never be used in a pejorative way. If it's medically relevant, fine. The same thing for the patient uh, might, uh, might be homosexual. It, how is that medically relevant to caring for the patient? If not, or the patient even might have AIDS. Do we need to share that information with all team members if that's not the reason why the patient is there and being cared for? Right? And the same thing for some mental illness. So how relevant and is it? And when you look at PHIPA, the Personal Health Information Act, Protection Act of Ontario, the, the key principle that governs uh, this uh, privacy law is the need to know. So what do members of the team or members of the circle of care really and truly need to know about this particular patient? This day and age, there's lots of information flying around and it's easy to, uh, to discriminate against our patients. Uh, in particular, when it comes to things like um, uh, mental illness, um, we, these are such vulnerable people who are already uh, discriminated against by society, uh, they've been deinstitutionalized into the streets and city parks and so on by their family members, some of them, uh, by potential employees. And we have to be very mindful that we are a hospital, which is a safe place, non-judgmental place. We must act very, very professionally. The next uh, stage is articulate the decision. So of all the options that we have explored in light of values and principles, we should ask ourselves which one of those four principles and values are competing uh, with each other and how do we prioritize them based on the patient's own values and, and wishes and preferences. Uh, once we've done that, we should articulate the decision as a team we're aiming for uh, where there's time, of course, to have a team meeting, we're aiming for a consensus decision, which is the, the best to justify to a college, to, a, to an organization, or indeed to a court of law. Um, there is not a democratic vote, but you want people to say, I, I uh, agree with the process that's quite robust, that's quite open and interactive and reflective, and even though I came in here thinking something else, I can see why it is uh, this is the preferred choice. I could actually live with it. Um, so let's articulate the decision then and the justification for it. Who is to implement that particular choice and when? Usually it would be the person, the staff member, who has most therapeutic alliance with the patient when is ideal and how to frame that information. It could be something like disclosure of bad news. Might have a family because of uh, cultural uh, grounds. Family members don't want uh, their loved one, mum or dad or child or grandma to know that they've got cancer with metastases and they've got three months to live. And that may have been the ethical dilemma. So who now, what process have we put together logistically, uh, not, to, not to isolate family members, uh, but to actively engage with them in order to address this very, very sensitive is issue with a serious cultural component. Um, so how are we going to frame things, who and when? 
Um, once that is done, the final step is, is, is stage nine, um, where we sit as a team again, or relevant members of the team, to do two things. One is an operational debrief. What lessons can we learn from this ethical issue uh, so as to be more proactive? Do we need to review guidelines or policies? Should we have identified this cultural issue way before it came up, you know, like a volcano, and, and then we needed to react rather than to respond? So what, what, what can we learn from this uh, scenario so that next time round we might uh, approach things a wee bit differently? And the second uh, debrief would be an emotional or psychological debrief where we have to be mindful of our staff members and how they have been impacted by uh, the, the dilemma and how family, family members or the patients might have spoken to them or uh, used abusive and threatening uh, behaviours towards them. Or it might have meant that a young child or, or a, a very nice patient that they've come to know in particularly well has passed on and we need to debrief because, of course, we as healthcare professionals, feeling as passionate as we do about uh, our patients' care, uh, we need to address our feelings so we don't carry those baggages home and have it impact our health and our personal relationships and so on.